Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. Today is episode 34 of our intermediate series. We're going to be discussing this absolutely wonderful species of python from Australia, the Centralian python or Bredel's python. Previously classed as the Centralian carpet python before being elevated to its own species by Gao in 1981. The reason for this, hello, yes, the reason for this being uh, the totally different scale counts in nearly every direction. The scales on the Centralian python are far smaller. Uh, Mark O'Shea discussed this. And also, if we look at the profile pictures, these were taken from Pythons of the World Volume 1 Australia. Really granular scales, clusters of uh, scales rather than the big plate-like scales that some of the other carpets have, certainly in between the eyes and the nose. So these were the the reasons that they uh, elevated it amongst others to its own species status. So rather than being a subspecies of Spilota, which the other carpets are like jungles and Irianjayas and Darwins and um, the uh, Southerns and Inlands, this is its own species. This is Morelia redli or Bredel's Morelia. Um, regardless of this, many of people, many people still refer to it as a carpet python, whilst others drop the moniker just to try and help differentiate it. You can't look at the camera. I'm talking into that camera. I'm talking into that camera. Okay. She's awesome. This is a heavy set snake where females, particularly in captivity, may attain lengths of up to nine feet in length and possess considerable girth. As with most Python species, sexual dimorphism is present and males are considerably smaller than females and carry far less bulk. Even though this is a large uh, species by Python standards, uh, but sorry, by carpet Python standards at least, uh, with only really the coastal carpet probably challenging it, uh, it is actually often less problematic than some of the Spiloita carpet Python uh, cousins so um the, the main reasons for this being one it's uh from further inland in australia and it's a drier location so it will shed at nominal humidity without an issue no you suffering and puffing i'm holding you and i'm doing a video with you all right <sighs> bloody women eh and number two despite its size eventually it's one of the naturally tamest species of carpet pythons and whilst exceptions do exist for the most part this species is a pleasure to work with a total joy mark o'shea noted uh, in nature this species has activity patterns vary wildly throughout the year owing to the severe heat in summer this species becomes um nocturnal and then conversely in spring and autumn is nearly exclusively diurnal and that's taken from boas and pythons of the world and we can look at this a little later with the climate data that we've printed out, as always. In captivity during growth periods of the year, a basking spot can be maintained at temperatures of between 34 and 35 degrees Celsius. And this should be localised to a stump, a branch or platform that the animal can then retreat from. Cool end temperatures should stay between 25 and 26 degrees Celsius. At night, the basking platform can safely be lowered to 26 degrees, with the cool end dropping off to 19 to 20 Celsius. Climbing opportunities will be used willingly. Hides and caves, particularly for younger animals, should be provided along uh, the thermal gradient of the vivarium. And the larger the snake becomes, the less bothered generally they become about hiding away. I mean, we should always try and offer it, but in reality, big adults generally, they just don't give a monkeys whether you're there or not. Um, Fife discussed considerable colour change from the wild caught specimens uh, after a few months in captivity and it's generally accepted that this has something to do with full spectrum lighting and UVB and the part that they play in this. Consideration therefore should definitely be given to providing this within the enclosure to maximise this species beauty which is already considerable um, but the, the, the wild colours were noted to be far redder, far richer, more rust like rather than the tans and oranges that we have here. Uh, this species is an unproblematic breeder 
and owing to the sharp <laughs> sharp falling this species value along with other carpet pythons compared to 20 25 years ago uh, when they first became available i remember going to germany with paul and he spent a large sum of money on two pairs of these uh, and they, th th these animals just aren't high value anymore they are prolific and actually prolific is probably an understatement very willing to breed uh, they respond to almost standardized bowid cycling by providing longer cooler nights and reducing photo period remember this species is southern hemisphere so photo period would change naturally and would play a part in triggering the breeding cycle uh, couple this with gentle misting and for the most part they should be more than willing to engage in copulation and some people they just periodically throughout the year will introduce them and probably find copulation happens anyway but this species certainly in uh, the wild would experience some really quite severe weather fluctuations which we'll discuss uh, and we should try and at least pay homage to this and mimic it. Uh, females can reproduce from six feet in length maybe slightly bigger than this uh, and around three years of age this girl's three years of age she's been grown on very uh, very competently and slowly which is the way they should be grown on she's not fat in any way um, but she is not a big snake yet by any stretch of the imagination although she is boisterous noisy and huffy puffy and busily trying to escape or find a way out and you can't go anywhere Are you listening no you're sissing chuff nut right so um, it, it's definitely better to let the females reach the larger, more mature adult size. Um, you know, I'd probably ex what, expect a girl to be four or five seasons old before we attempt to breed in. Uh, this will improve individual egg size and therefore the babies will be larger, making them easier to raise. Males will reproduce from as little as 24 months old. Do not cohabit for this reason. We do not want the female getting caught earlier than is safe. Barker and Barker in their first Python Bible, Pythons of the World Volume 1, Australia, which every keeper of Australian species, Australian Python species should have in their library, uh, gave an egg yield of between 13 to 47 eggs. So there in of itself, we can see that there is huge variability in the fecundancy of females dependent on size. And almost certainly the 47 egg will have been a very big snake indeed. And 13 eggs down the bottom end, probably the size of this girl. Um, and that was from uh, six clutches. And this illustrates how variable they can be. Uh, and Barker and Barker cite a 67 day incubation at 30 degrees. But actually nowadays a lot of keepers incubate slightly warmer around 32 Celsius and they see hatching around 60 days time. Hatchlings will shed and feed without issue once they've had chance to absorb the last of the yolk they stored from their egg. Feeding trials can begin from two to three weeks of age. Uh, some will kick in quicker than others, but generally there is little if any protracted issues with carpet pythons kicking in. Just some patience and just annoying it till it strikes and wraps. Sometimes they'll wrap and then they'll let go and look at you again. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a game and it can be a bit of a farce, but all it requires is patience and usually they're more than willing to kick in. Uh, first meals would be uh, defrosted fuzzy mice and they would quickly progress on small mice. Uh, carpet pythons can grow rapidly and be very, very greedy. For this reason, restraint must be exercised to avoid obesity or the dreaded pinhead, where you've got the body of an adult and the head of a yearling. This is a heavy set snake anyway, so no need to go overboard. It, it will do the snake zero favours in the long run. Adult size vivarium for a large female should be around five feet long, three feet high, two feet deep, and a female uh, and a male, sorry, would be fine in a vivarium measuring four feet by three feet high by two feet deep. The added height being to encourage their natural climbing behaviours. Heating should be provided by a ceramic heat emitter or chi as some people refer to it with a dome holder to try and drive that heat down into the tank onto the basking platform or branch. And this of course should be coupled to a reliable day and night thermostat so that we can give it the temperatures that we've recommended in their daily fluctuation. To maximise colours as discussed, provisions of UVB lighting should, such as a shade dweller from Arcadia or a similar, um, a similar solution from uh, reptile systems um, should be used and this should be placed towards the same end as the ceramic so that photoregulation and thermoregulation can both be achieved. Um, this basically means that 
pr previously we would have flooded the entire Viv if we were going to use UV from warm end to cold end. But actually, uh, the research that Roman uh, Murren and Fran Baines have been doing suggests that actually uh, there should be um, some photo regulation. So, i.e., there should be light and there should be shade and there should be darkness so they can pick where they want to be dependent on when they want to receive, receive the UVB. Or they want to, the same way that they would do that if they wanted to warm up or cool down. You are a gob. What are you offing and puffing for? I need to breathe heavy like that. We're not, we're not doing anything wrong. Soft lads. So, um, substrate should be a dry choice, such as aspen, obios, hemp, lignocell, or aspen. Um, if a more naturalistic choice is wanted using an arid, arid desert mix substrate such as like pro rep Beardy Life or Leo Life mixed with core or dry topsoil would work. This would be harder to clean and more costly but are undoubtedly more aesthetic. But, you know, um, I mean, they're not super mucky snakes, so, you know, you could potentially get away with it. Modern housing uh, can uh, can be dry, particularly at this time of year with the central heating on a lot of the time and it dries the environment out. So a damp hide may be required to ensure good sheds. Now, I've said that they, they generally shed at nominal humidity, but heating wrecks that sometimes and dries really dries the, the the rooms out so just that localized damp pipe may work doesn't need to be in there permanently just when they're going through the shed cycle to help them out natural distribution <laughs> excuse me what yeah well you're choking me no use moaning <sighs> natural distribution is restricted around the mcdonnell range in southern northern territory so the blue circle the x in the middle is alice springs which we used as our uh, temperature data point uh, they occur uh, along the banks of the todd and charles river great name uh, and they also occur from the james range and heart range they make use of trees and vegetation in this region and also make use of rocky outcrops and the fissures in rocks in which to retreat in particularly warm or particularly cold weather Alice Springs is the largest conurbation in the region, placed roughly at the centre of the McDonald range. So the climate data was provided from there, the X. So we needed something to counterpoint that and we decided to use Darwin, which is the X up here, which is the Darwin carpet python Morelia spilota variegata. And we just wanted to look at the way that these things changed. So looking at the climate data, let's just have a quick butcher's. We've got Alice Springs and then our control area, which is Darwin. So Darwin's there, Alice Springs. Alice Springs, serious stuff. January, because they're Southern Hemisphere, their year works differently to ours, the opposite of the UK, as it were. So winter, summer, and summer's winter. January, average temperatures in Alice Springs, 37 Celsius. Seriously warm. 34 and 36 November, December. Then daytime highs in June, July for their cool season of 20 Celsius. To counterpoint this, we use Darwin, who is nowhere near as warm during the, their summer months, but stays far warmer during their winter months. And that's a reflection of being closer to the equator. So they don't have the level of fluctuation. And this is shown in our... Excuse me, where are you going? I'm trying to do a video here. No use off him. The fluctuation... At Alice Springs between daytime high and nighttime low is far more. 15 and 16 degrees Celsius. That's the flux between daytime high and nighttime low. So we can see this is the amount of degrees of fluctuation per day. Darwin is far more stable with generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius as their deviation. Whereas we're anything from 15 up to 16 or 18 degrees Celsius difference during the day and night. So these snakes should, in theory, really respond to a drop off for their nighttime cool down. And we've got our nighttime lows here and we can really see the blue drop off for Alice Springs with a nighttime low in June and July of four or five Celsius. Um, and then the nighttime low, uh, sorry, the nighttime low in uh, their summer is 22 and 20 degrees Celsius. So a good old difference. You know, we're talking 17 degrees uh, median temperatures, we've got Alice Springs 29.5, 28.5, 25, 21, 15.5, 12.5, 12, 14, 20, 23.5, 26 and 28. Have you finished? Yeah, hi. 
So a real, real variation. This is a hardy carpet python, and we'll put up with a lot more in the way of fluctuation, and we'll definitely be more easy going with requirements and a lot less specific, unlike the more uh, tropical uh, carpets such as the jungles or the Irian gyres, which would be more insulated. And we know for a fact that Irian gyres temperature um, is generally pretty much linear, 24 degrees at night all the time and 31, 32 degrees a year round during the day. So none of the flux that the bread lie have, which is why the bread lie has been such a successful uh, python species in captivity and therefore it's very popular and I expect that this video will be popular because people love to to know about these they're absolutely ace so this snake was first described by Gao in 1981 as python bread lion was subsequently reclassified into the genus Morelia by McDarmid Campbell and Chore in 1999 despite a brief flirtation with the Spilota complex in 1990 thanks to Fife it remains Morelia bread lie, as confirmed by Mens, Schlepp and O'Shea, Reynolds and Wallach respectively thank you Type locality is given as Pitchy Ritchie Park, which I think is quite possibly the coolest name ever, in Alice Springs, Northern Territory, Australia. And the etymology means Breddle's Morelia, named in honour of Joseph Breddle, father of the barefoot bushman Rob Breddle, uh, and Mr Breddle Sr. created the Edward River Crocodile Farm and was the owner of the Renmark Reptile Park in South Australia. I hope you enjoyed that video. We've tried to provide the data as always, and I've got that saved, so I'm hopefully going to include that on the Facebook uh, post that we make as well. Superb species, but just take it easy with the food. They're going to grow really well anyway. They're going to eventually reach their sort of seven and a half, eight feet and be thick set. So there's no need to rush it. This snake at three years old, they really took their time with it. It's been absolutely, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous specimen. Um, and yeah, I mean, don't be fooled. They're very food orientated, but Breddles are far more laid back than particularly baby jungles and baby irians, which will make pin cushions out of you. Um, Andy and Kathy were the owners of this snake said that in the three years that they've had this since being a baby, they've never been bit once. So an, an, an absolute joy of a python to keep and maintain. We'll be back with another video soon. From me and the lovely Lucy, we'll see you soon. All the best, guys. Peace.